Hi, my name is Steve Kinsley, and I have a question on the optimization of integrated quality assessments. How does the FDA maintain a balanced workload among these aligned teams for the ANDAs and the DMFs? Well, in answer to that question, the major issues involved in balancing the workload are determining the capacity for each individual team and then assessing the relative challenges presented in each submission. So basically you have two issues here. One is the availability of reviewers. And again, we can only review so many things so fast. And the second one is how difficult the review is. So if a reviewer gets a very difficult review, this is a much more simpler review, um, then it can affect the amount of time they spend on the review. For an ANDA submission, we actually do a very quick triage. And we determine whether the form is a dosage form is a liquid or a solid. And so basically we have two groups of reviewers, and they're separated by people who are experts in the review of liquid um, dosage forms, and then the reviewers who are experts in the review of solid forms. So the first thing is a split between the liquid and the solid. The next thing we do is we triage the review to determine the expertise required and to determine the challenges of the review, because we want the review to go to the right reviewer, because that's the best for uh, consistency and the best for uh, your application. And then also we want to, again, assist the relative challenges in the review, so we can make an estimate on how long it will take a reviewer to do his assessment. Then we assign the reviews to balance the workloads between teams. Okay, so we have our reviewers broken into smaller teams. This, again, gives you much better reviews because the Reviewers are familiar with each other on the team and familiar with the types of applications that they review. And then the first, so the first level of balance is gonna be how to get the teams balanced. Once the teams are balanced, then it's up to the team leaders to balance the workload between assessors. Now I've got a graphic that'll kind of demonstrate what I mean here. So we have a submission come in, and let's say this is a solid dosage form. That's gonna to go to our solid dosage form team. They're gonna triage it, and they're gonna decide based on team load and based on expertise that this review should go to team one. You'll notice team one has fewer reviews total than teams two and teams three in this case. So this one would go to team one. And again, uh, this would mean that this reviewer uh, uh, now is coming up to a fuller workload. Now, let's say that during the time before another submission comes in, we have team three finish a few of their reviews. So now they have some capacity here. Now they're the low capacity team. And now when a new dosage form comes in, that's gonna to go to team three. And again, we'll go to a reviewer or assessor number eight because they were the ones with light and the load. And so again, this is the pro how the process works. And if you look over time, you're gonna have reviews being completed, reviews being assigned. And so basically it's up to the team leader and then ultimately the uh, uh, triage to determine which team gets the review and how to balance these out. So this is a very good question. I enjoyed answering it and thank you very much and have a very pleasant day. Hello, my name is Madhu Gauravaram. Today, I'm joined by Commander David Skanky to answer the questions submitted to the poster number 11 on review of secondary type 2 drug master files. The first question is, the slide number 12 in the presentation indicates that it is, accept it is acceptable to reference another API DMF as a secondary DMF for a critical intermediate, as long as it is clearly mentioned in the primary DMF that the reference is only for a particular intermediate. One clarification that may be very helpful regarding referencing a secondary DMF partially is regarding how the primary DMF will be deemed adequate and eventually how the handoff approval status will be determined. If the secondary DMF is deficient, albeit for deficiencies that are not related to the particular critical intermediate, it is referencing. For example, API not characterized properly, specification and analytical methods of API are deficient, failures in API stability or API testing facilities are not compliant, in compliance. As a general principle, all DMFs are reviewed in the context of how they are referenced. So, if a DMF has a partial difference by another DMF for an intermediate material, the primary DMF and the application it supports are only impacted by the regulatory status adequate or inadequate of that specific reference information. 
The secondary DMF could be adequate for the intermediate information presented in it, even if at the same time it was inadequate for the final API due to the reasons not related to the quality of the intermediate. In terms of facilities, only the secondary DMF facilities associated with the manufacture of the intermediate, assuming it is a critical intermediate, would be listed in the ANDA or NDA application and impact the approvability, approvability of the corresponding application. The next question is, is secondary DMF key starting material or intermediate manufacturing site inspection mandatory for review of respective drug substance DMF and approval of ANDA? The manufacturing process of all intermediates, including those described in a secondary DMF, are subject to GMP for ICHQ7. We recommend that all critical intermediate sites be listed in the referencing applications 356H form. Determination, of, determination on whether an intermediate facility needs a comprehensive evaluation or inspection is made on a case-by-case -case basis using risk assessment principles as outlined in ICHQ11, as well as using the manufacturing process information and the control strategy presented in both primary and secondary DMF. The final question is, what is the validity period for a LOA? If DMF holder issues LOA at the time of filing ANDA, is it not valid till the approval time? There is no expiry on an LOA and it is valid until an updated LOA is issued by the holder or until the holder withdraws it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yan Ma. This question is for poster number 12 on the topic of USP pending monograph process. The question is, in case based on the method equivalency reports, if in-house methods were found superior to the USP methods after FDA's approval, can applicants initiate USP PMP process to have their in-house methods added to the USP NF monographs? Well, we recommend that the applicant initiates the USP PMP process concurrently with the submission of the application to the FDA to avoid delay in the approval of the application. The applicant may petition to add their in-house methods to the USP NF monographs after FDA's approval. However, this approach is not the USP PMP process. It is a current established process for the revision of an official USP monograph. Hello, my name is Jenny Wong, and these two questions are from poster number 12 on the topic of USP compliance for industry. The questions ask, when USP monograph method is adopted for testing of drug substance, should complete method validation be performed or method verification with system suitability, specificity, precision, quantitation limit, and solution stability is sufficient. Is this applicable to adopt USP monographs for post-approval changes and also for approved ANDAs? According to 21 CFR, users of analytical methods described in USP NF are not required to validate the accuracy and the reliability of these methods, but merely verify their suitability and their actual conditions of use. Therefore, if a USP monograph method is adopted for testing a drug substance, a complete method validation as per USP 1225 is not required. Well, a method verification as per USP 1226 
including system suitability, specificity, precision, quantitation limit, and solution stability should be sufficient. Please note that quantitation limit is not applicable to the verification of assay methods. The above response is also applicable when the USP monograph methods are adopted for poster approval changes to drug substances. We are not assessors for ANDA applications, and we are not in a position to address any questions related to ANDAs. Hi, my name is Dong Lei Yu. There are some questions for poster 13 on the topic of elemental impurities. The first question. In the presentation, it is said that FDA requires DMF holders to provide risk assessment of elemental impurities for the manufacturing process of drug substances. Where is this written in guidance? It would be really helpful if you could point us to the right direction for this requirement. ICHQ3D has recommendations on applying a risk-based approach to control elemental impurities and the permitted daily exposure for new finished drug products and new drug products containing existing drug substances. The following diagram shows an example of typical materials, equipment, and components used in the production of a drug product. Each of these sources may contribute elemental impurities to the drug product. The manufacturers should consider all potential sources of elemental impurities, including the drug substance excipients and elements introduced from manufacturing equipment or container closure system. During the manufacturing process of drug substances, metal catalysts are commonly used. In addition to elements intentionally added during the manufacturing process, some other elements from raw materials or equipment may also contribute to the elemental impurities in the drug substances. Information for this risk assessment includes, but is not limited to, data generated by the applicant, information supplied by drug substance and or excipient manufacturers, and or data available in published literature. Usually, the drug product applicants do not have the information on drug substance manufacturing process. Although ICHQ3D applies to finished drug products, the DMF holders are highly recommended to perform risk assessment of elemental impurities in their drug substance and work closely with each drug product applicant to ensure compliance. Next question. On slide 12, you said, elemental impurities to be treated like related substances and to be tested routinely. Do you mean catalysts used or all elemental impurities? This is slide 12. It talked about a special case, lanthanum carbonate. SHQ3D does not cover this atypical drug substance. The element lanthanum is an active drug. There is no catalyst used in the synthesis. However, the elemental contaminants from the study material cannot be removed during the manufacturing process of lanthanum carbonate. All possible impurities should be evaluated. That's why we suggested 
that the elemental impurities should be treated like related substances and routinely controlled in the drug substance specification. In slide 13, we have recommendations on which elemental impurities should be controlled, how to determine the PDEs, how to justify the limits, and how to justify the omission of routine testing. Lanthanum cabinet is a special case. For most DMFs, the elemental impurities to be evaluated can be found in Table 5.1 of ICHQ3D. Please refer to slides 5 to 9 for element classification, PDEs per root of administration, limit calculation, and the data to be included in the submission. As for catalysts, SHQ3D has included most catalysts used by the pharmaceutical industry. If a drug substance uses a catalyst which is not listed in Table 5.1, this element needs to be evaluated since it is intentionally added. Please refer to slide 11 for the determination of the PDE. Hi, my name is David Green, and this question is from poster 14 on the topic of mutagenic impurities and old APIs, drug substances, that have existing monographs, and asks, for existing old APIs that have a USP or European pharmacopoeial monograph, is an evaluation slash risk analysis required for mutagenic impurities from a drug substance at the time of the DMF submission? Answer. In order to classify impurities per the DMF holder's unique manufacturing process, all new drug master files submitted to the agency should perform an impurity hazard assessment per ICHM7. Please refer to Section 6 of the ICHM7 guidance. Regardless of whether the API has an existing USP or European pharmacopoeial monograph, this should be done at the time of filing. The exceptions are those APIs that are out of the scope of M7. Please refer to Section 2 of the guidance and the ICH M7 Q&A document, numbers 2.1, 4.1, and 6.3. Those exceptions are biological, biotechnological, peptide, oligonucleotides, radiopharmaceutical, fermentation, herbal, and crude products of animal or plant origin. Also, drugs intended to be used for advanced cancer. And finally, APIs that are genotoxic at therapeutic concentrations. Hi, this is Dr. Yongjin Gao. I will answer some questions for poster number 15. The first question is about drug product dose. If the drug substance DMF holder doesn't know the drug product dose, how can a limit be set based on clinical relevance? It's imperative that the drug substance DMF holder communicates with the drug product applicants regarding the intended use of the drug substance and the maximum daily dose. Please be reminded that if a DMF holder doesn't know the MDD of the drug product, even the SHQ3A qualification threshold and identification threshold cannot be cited. The second question is about case 4, comparative impurity analysis. The case 4 slide suggests that acceptance criteria may be supported by comparative impurity analysis for the proposed drug substance and the RRD. Does this suggestion mean to use the drug product that is RRD for comparison? Yes, it's generally recommended that the comparative impurity analysis should be conducted using at least three batches of the DMF holder's drug substance and three batches of the RD drug product.
The third question is about case six. Acceptance criteria for metabolite impurities. Why are the acceptance criteria of significant metabolites limited to the ICH qualification level? If the toxicology of a metabolite is established, the acceptance criteria should be higher than the qualification limit. A limit higher than the qualification limit for a metabolite impurity may be acceptable with appropriate justification. The justification should provide quantitative information. For example, plasma levels of the metabolites in animals and humans at the maximum daily dose, or the exposure levels in animals that equals or exceeds the proposed clinical exposure levels. To demonstrate that the systemic exposure is at such a level to qualify the proposed level of the impurity. Hello, my name is Fatima Sakura, and this question was received for poster 17 on the topic of advice for post-approval API changes. Our company is planning on transferring our API process to a second manufacturing site. What mechanisms are there for us to discuss our plans for a DMF amendment with the FDA? This includes the characterization of the change, the best approach to include information in various DMF sections, as well as the best approach to demonstrate equivalency of intermediates in the final drug substance. First, we recommend that you look at the available FDA guidance on the topics, and we refer you to the guidance for industry, changes to an approved NDA or ANDA, as well as our draft guidance for industry post-approval changes to drug substances. If after looking at the available guidance, you have questions on either the appropriate content for your DMF amendment for supporting the change or the appropriate supplemental filing category for the change, please use informal communication by submitting an email to dmfogd at fda.hhs.gov. Please remember in your email to include a complete description of the change, address and FEI number for any associated facilities, as well as a proposed submission date for the DMF amendment. This information is sufficient for us to offer advice on the supplement filing category, which you can share with your customers, and on information to include in your DMF amendment to document the change. Thank you so much and have a great day. Hello, my name is Commander Benjamin Dancer and this question is for post number 18 on teleconference under the topic TCON grant deny decision. And the question asks, in the event that a DMF holder receives a grant with written response to a teleconference request that they place to the agency, does this mean that the DMF holder could still ask for a 30-minute telephone meeting with the agency? And the answer is, a TCON grant with a written response from the agency serves two purposes. The written response is meant to provide the DMF holder with answers to the questions in full or in part submitted in the TCON request. The DMF holders, upon receipt of the agency's written response, may consider that as a closure to their query if the written response provided them with enough clarity to move forward with answering the CR letter. On the other hand, if the DMF holder still sees the need to have a telephone conversation with the agency, the holder still has the opportunity to do so. At this point, the DMF holder should reach out to the RBPM and request that the meeting be scheduled. When proceeding with a TCON, we recommend the holder use any information provided in a written response to make the 30-minute TCON as efficient as possible. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Saad Ahmed and this question is from question number 19 on the topic of list of relevant quality guidances for DMA preview and ask. As regards your poster on the deficiencies commonly observed in section S.3.2 of the DMF, you state that all the potential impurities that may be present in the API must be discussed. However, we have observed that FDA inquires about other impurities during CR letters. Though the DMA folder discusses the potential impurities that he has actually observed during development and are consistently present in his process. How can a DMA folder interpret slash evaluate what other impurities need to be evaluated and discussed in the DMF other than those actually observed? Answer. DMA folder should include a discussion on potential and observed impurities from the quality perspective on a case-by-case -case basis, i.e. based on synthetic scheme and manufacturing process. Discussion may include process impurities including potential side products, potential contaminant due to solvents or reagent used in the manufacturing process, Possible impurities due to competing reaction. Impurities possible by the synthetic route, particularly static materials introduced late in the process or degradation impurities. Discussion of the downstream analogs along with supporting data and control strategies. If you receive a complete response or deficiency comment, about an impurity that is not observed or likely cannot be formed from your route of synthesis and manufacturing process, then it is acceptable to respond that the impurity is not possible or likely, along with your scientific rationale and any supporting information such as analytical data or literature references. We refer you to ICS Q11 that discuss use of risk assessment tools to better understand link between process and quality. And ICS M7 section 5, which pertains directly to actual and potential impurities and hazard assessment expectations. Question number two from the poster number 19 on the topic of list of relevant quality guidances for DMA preview and ask. When does the agency plan to finalize the post-approval changes to drug substance drug guidance issued in September 2018? Again, it is recognized that this conference focuses on Godofa DMFs, but some of these guidances need to be finalized as one DMF may support multiple andas, some of which could be under review. Answer. FD has received public input from stakeholders regarding this draft guidance in comments submitted to the public docket. FD will determine next step based on our analysis of comments and revise the draft guidance as necessary. Please be advised that FDA's guidance documents, including draft guidances such as this, do not establish legally enforceable responsibilities. Instead, Guidances describe the agency's current thinking on a topic and should be viewed only as recommendations, unless specific regulatory or statutory requirements are cited. The use of the word should in agency's guidance means that something is suggested or recommended but not required. Question number three from the question number 19 on the topic of list of relevant quality guidances for DMF review and ask. Is the submission of process validation mandatory or any requirement? Historically, validation information has not been submitted. Answer. FDA regulation describing current good manufacturing practice for finished pharmaceuticals are provided in 21 CFR parts 210 and 211. Process validation is required 
in both general and specific terms by the CGMP regulation in parts 210 and 211. We refer you ICS Q7. Question number four from the poster number 19 on the topic of list of relevant quality guidances for DMA preview and ask. Does the statement caution for manufacturing, processing or repacking need to be part of the product label or it can be a separate label or sticker on the container? Answer. Yes. The caution statement need to be part of the product label which requires specific labeling on the package such as caution for manufacturing, processing or repacking. Information that goes on the label should be part of the label not on a sticker. You can be referred to ICS Q7. On behalf of all the poster presenters, thank you for listening to the answers to your questions. You can continue to view the posters and ask questions by using the link on the workshop poster page. We'll accept questions until March 19th for inclusion in the poster Q&A session in the follow-on webinar on April 9th.